Good evening, everyone. I am uh, Gopesh Modi hosting the webinar today. And uh, we have Dr. Ajay Kher, who is a senior nephrologist uh, at Vishwanath Kilian and Primus Hospital, New Delhi, taking over immunological workup for transplant patients, a topic close to the heart, because I probably got to see maximum number of registrations in this uh, webinar in the recent memory that I have. Dr. AJ, everybody knows, uh, did his medical school at Alden Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Then he did his nephrology fellowship and a stint at consultant uh, position in Boston, USA. Then at Vedanta. So over to Ajay for your uh, next uh, brilliant presentation, quite like we've seen earlier. I hope everybody can hear me. Welcome, everyone. And uh, after the presentation, you can uh, type in your questions in the chat box, which I'll take on one by one. So over to you, Ajay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Modi. Um, so my talk is going to be on um, the HLA typing and we'll talk a little bit about matching versus mismatching also. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about sensitization history, which is probably the most underutilized part of our evaluation. Uh, and then we'll talk about the cross match CDC as well as flow. We'll talk about the single antigen bead uh, by Luminex and how to assess if HLA antibodies are actually donor specific or they're just anti-HLA antibodies. A panel reactive antibody, what does it mean? A CPRA, DSA lysate, and the only thing that we're going to talk about is why not to use it. And then we'll come back with some take home messages at the end. So the HLA molecule is on chromosome six. Uh, this is kind of the classic, um, you have class one antigens, which are A, B, and C. And these class one antigens are present on all cells, P and B cells. When we are doing a cross match, uh, this is important um, to kind of assess whether it is due to class one antibodies or class two. Uh, T and B cell cross match will be positive if there are class one antibodies. Class two antigens are only on antigen presenting cells. So in this case, the B cells. And so uh, if only a class two antibody is present, only the B cell cross match will be positive and the T cell uh, should not be positive in that situation. So let's talk a little bit about the polymorphism of HLA. So in the old days, they used to do serology. So which is, if you were to label something, it would be labeled as HLA DR3, for example. And for HLA A, there were 28 uh, different uh, serological types. For B, about 60. For DR, about 24. And this is an old slide. So the numbers are now probably much, much uh, more. Uh, now we have DNA, uh, HLA typing, uh, DNA base, which is what uh, the star denotes uh, in the name. So like DRB1, the star, that denotes that this is done by DNA typing. Uh, and so HLA A has more than 700, B more than 1000, DR more than 2000 different HLA alleles. And this is increasing every day as more and more uh, genotypings are done and more and more alleles are described. So how is current HLA typing done? Uh, so the modern molecular techniques, so there is the SSP, which is sequence specific primers or sequence specific oligonucleotides. And then there is the next, gen next generation uh, sequencing uh, that is available. And you can do low resolution typing or high resolution typing. And this is based on the kind of primers and the specificity uh, of the primers that are available. So if you do a two digit, which is, uh, for example, DRB104. So that's a low resolution typing. And then high resolution typing would be where you get four digits, for example, 0401 and 0402 kind of differentiation that you can get uh, would be high resolution typing. And with next gen sequencing, you can also get six digit or eight digit uh, typing. But for most of our purposes, uh, high resolution I'm going to talk about uh, is going to be a four digit. And there are certain techniques with SSP and SSO that can give you intermediate uh, resolution uh, where they may not be able to give you conclusive four digit for all the genotype, for all the uh, alleles, but may be able to give you four digits for most of the common uh, alleles. So this is kind of the typing. So now let's talk about how the typing is done. So, so on the left, you have uh, blood which you take, uh, out of which you take the Buffy coat where all your leukocytes and uh, WBCs are, so you can get DNA from them. So then 
you uh, extract the DNA and you put it on this microwell plate. Uh, with the microwell plate, in for each person, you would make one plate for each person. And in each well, you put a different primer. Uh, so each well has a different primer, which you do by a particular sequence that has uh, been pre decided by the company that has made the primers. So then you have these primers that you uh, put in. Uh, you put this plate into the PCR machine, which is on the left side. And then you run your PCR cycles. So um, the uh, PCR probes uh, will bind with the DNA and uh, then uh, there'll be a replication and multiplication of that particular um, amplicon. And then you take from each well and coat on a DNA uh, gel. Um, each uh, well goes in a uh, each uh, well goes in a separate well for the DNA and then you run the gel and you get a sheet like this. So if you see there are these bands which are there and these are the positive bands. So so uh, for example, this is in uh, specific bands and then uh, these specific bands then you will uh, have a worksheet that is given by the company that's made the primers. Uh, so this actually is my uh, DNA uh, that I had run um, when I was in fellowship. And uh, so this is kind of the worksheet that you do. So as you can see, the well eight was positive. So you make a line all across. You run against 10, 12 and 15. These were the amplicons which were positive. And so if you look at the 15, uh, that turns out to be from DRB 107 and so that is definitive and for the others you'll continue on to different pages. Uh, this is like a 30 page uh, thing and based on that you come out with uh, what your final HLA assignment is which for me uh, was A0103, B4458, DRB 711 and I had DRB3 and DRB4 so these uh, DRB3, DRB4 and DRB5 are drop-ins. So someone may have them or may not have them. And these are called uh, DR51, 52, 53 from the serological typing. And uh, these are uh, usually not done in the current typing that we do in India. Um, and so if someone has a DRB345 antibody, you may want to ask for the specific typing. And then the DQB uh, beta uh, was 0, 02 and 0, 03. So that's how um, the um, old school HLA DNA typing is done. Uh, now we have these SSO primers. Um, and so again, you do the DNA extraction. Uh, you have these specific uh, amplificated, uh, specific primers which are biotinylated. Uh, again, you have these. Uh, wells which have uh, these SSO probes that are already fixed inside so you don't have to add them to the micro well plate uh, they're already added each uh, well has one specific primer in it uh, when you put it inside there will be hybridization and if there is hybridization uh, then uh, these biotinylated primers are going to activate an enzyme and with that uh, enzyme you get a black spot so depending on which of these wells have black spots a computer will read uh, these wells and then tell you um, based on uh, the primers and the specific um, catalog from the company they'll tell you uh, what your hla alleles are so this is through sso and it's a similar thing for ssp um, hla typing by ngs um, uh, which is next gen sequencing is again um, similar in thought process but different in how it's done. Uh, again, it can be by primers uh, with a PCR product and then you have those PCR products that are identified or you have primers with biotinylated probes. And again, um, these um, to get next gen sequencing, you need multiple reads that overlap with each other so that you get the whole uh, gene that is covered. Uh, and then these multiple reads are put into a computer algorithm which runs it against the HLA database and then the computer algorithm will give you the best fits for the HLA alleles uh, that this person has. So 
what are uh, the possible issues that can happen with HLA typing? So one of the possibilities is that the um, PCR product doesn't bind to the DNA. And so there can be drop offs. Um, and sometimes the drop offs because um, the HLA lab may not uh, know for sure whether it's a drop off or whether it is the same HLA. So then they may represent it as an X. Um, which uh, in this case would be an A0101 and the other one, the PCR product wasn't there and so it's being picked up as a drop off and they may say that we don't have it. Uh, it's also possible that uh, it is an A0101 and another A0101. And so um, the next gen sequencing and the HLA lab uh, has to be sure uh, that there isn't a drop off uh, and there are uh, specific check things uh, that the lab does uh, to ensure that that's not the case. Uh, and then they can uh, specifically tell you that, yes, this is 0101 as well as another 0101, um, which uh, would be uh, important to know uh, mm -hmm. when you're doing uh, the HLA typing in assessment for rejection, uh, as well as when you're doing HLA typing to kind of prove relationships uh, in which case, whether it's a drop off or uh, whether it's the same allele um, is important. Occasionally, um, there may be two or three possible fits or possible reads uh, that are um, an option. And then um, the computer will give those to the HLA lab person and then they will decide which one they think is the right one. And many times the lab will use Indian data to say that this is more likely. Uh, and uh, they could be wrong uh, on that as well. So it's important to uh, be aware that many times uh, the lab may not be 100% sure. Uh, and so if you think that there may be an issue, you should talk to the HLA lab to see whether the other possibilities were there or not. And sometimes the lab may actually uh, give you an output where they slash it like in this one 0101 or 0104 as the possibilities uh, for a particular person um, as well and this is usually when you're doing four digit uh, that you may have these kind of issues so now we'll switch a little bit about matching and mismatching so what are the matching possibilities so if you have a child and uh, you're a parent it will be one haplotype either direction if it's a sibling, there is a 25% chance of a zero match, 25% chance of a two haplotype match, and a 50% chance of a one haplotype match. So this is pretty easy and most uh, nephrologists kind of know this. Uh, sometimes there's a little confusion in terms of match versus mismatch and how to read it. So I'll kind of give a couple of examples uh, of that. So let's take this donor as an example. So the donor is A1, A11, and this is the low level uh, typing uh, b8 b15 and dr4 with an x which we are going to assume is dr4 dr4 the recipient is a1 a11 b8 b37 dr4 and dr15 so if you look at matching so they match um, and in terms of the mismatch um, b15 and dr4 the second dr4 is where they are not similar to each other but the recipient can make antibodies only against B15. It won't make antibody against the X, which is the DR4, because the recipient himself has DR4 as well. And so if you're looking at mismatches, what we want with mismatches is how many HLA alleles can this person make an antibody against? And in that case, this is a one by six mismatch because this person can only make an antibody against B15 but it's a four by six match. So if you're looking at matching to prove relationship and that uh, aspect of it, it's a four by six match, but it's a one by six mismatch. So now let's look at the same donor recipient combination and flip them. So um, now the recipient from the previous is the donor and the donor is the recipient. So now if you look at the mismatch, we this recipient can make an antibody against B37 and also against DR15. So it's a two by six mismatch and four by six match. 
So, so this is important when we try and assess what are the risks for rejection and um, how uh, the mismatching is, uh, because the mismatching is more important uh, in, in uh, the risk profile uh, for a donor recipient pair. So this can be um, important to ensure that the homozygosity, as we discussed above, is real and not due to a drop off. Uh, so now let's look at uh, a high resolution situation. So we've converted the same uh, into a high resolution where the donor is A0101, 1103, B802, B1515, DRB401 and 402. And uh, the recipient is as below. So now if we look at the low resolution, the low resolution, there is one uh, mismatch, which is the B1515 and all the others at a low resolution would be matching. Um, but if we do high resolution mismatching, so now there is an A0101, which doesn't match to the 0102 in the recipient, and the DRB0402 is different than the 0401 that uh, the recipient has. So, uh, so now on a high resolution, this mismatching is going to be three by six. Um, so as we get more information uh, by high resolution typing, uh, we will uh, need to improve our uh, assignment and assessment of the mismatching as well. So why is mismatching or matching important? So if you look at this is one out of 100 different studies that have done the same thing. This is from the Australia New Zealand database and this is graph failure on the uh, and the proportion of graft survival um, and it goes to the, those with zero mismatch which is this black line on the top they have the best survival and those who have six mismatches have the worst outcomes and again one two and three are pretty close together and four five and six are pretty close together and zero does the best so so that's kind of why it's important to know what your mismatching is uh, because that will uh, project out to overall outcomes so now we'll switch to sensitization history. Um, I think it's one of the under-recognized parts of our evaluation. And the things to evaluate a person for are whether they've had a previous transplant, previous pregnancy and the number of pregnancy, previous transfusion and the number, and whether they've ha had any whole blood transfusions, which would uh, increase the risk for sensitization quite a bit. And then another part is the donor relationship. Um, and the predominant thing to try and assess is has the recipient seen these donor antigens before so specifically son to mother or daughter to mother where the mother has seen these antigens in the womb or a husband to wife where um, the wife has seen these antigens through the husband's genes and a husband's HLA in the children and so these are going to be high risk uh, transplants because these are antigens that the mother has actually seen before. So then let's talk about the anti-HLA antibody detection. And uh, these come with the CDC cross-match, flow cross-match, flow PRA, and the single antigen beads. So we'll talk about each of these tests uh, over the next uh, few minutes. Starting with uh, the CDC cross-match, which was first uh, published by Terasaki. And uh, he found uh, that 19% of people had any HLA antibodies, which is kind of similar to what we have right now, which is 15% to 20% based on different studies. Uh, and what he showed in that study uh, was that those who had a positive cross match um, were 80% of those of immediate failure of those who had a positive cross match, 80% of them had immediate failures, meaning hyperacute rejection. Uh, in comparison, if you had no antibodies, which is the last column, only 2.4% of them had hyperacute rejections or immediate failures, which were probably not hyperacute rejections, but due to other vascular thromboses or technical issues, probably. So what this showed uh, was that hyperacute rejections were predominantly antibody-mediated uh, events. And since then, the whole antibody revolution has happened. So what is the CDC cross match, which is what the Terasaki study was based on. So uh, the steps are we start with step A, which is you take the recipient sera, 
you isolate the donor lymphocytes and you would isolate the donor B lymphocytes separately and T lymphocytes separately to do a CDC T cell cross match or a B cell cross match. And the recipient serum may have donor specific antibodies and then you mix it with complement. So first you incubate the donor lymphocytes with the serum. Then after they've incubated for a while, you wash the cells. Then you go in with the uh, complement and see uh, if the cells um, are viable. So uh, if there are no HLA antibodies, uh, no donor antibodies, donor uh, antibodies, then there are nothing sticking to these lymphocytes. The lymphocytes stay viable uh, and it's a negative cross match, which is the left side. If there are antibodies, they will stick to the cells. You go in with the complement. Uh, the complement will make uh, the membrane attack complex. The cell will have holes. And then what you will find is that uh, the cells are not viable and have lysed, and that's a positive cross match. So what a CDC cross match tells you is that there is a complement binding anti-donor antibody. What it doesn't tell you or what it leaves open is these antibodies could be IgG antibodies or IgM antibodies. They could be autoantibodies and other non hla antibodies also. So it doesn't tell you for sure whether these anti-donor antibodies are actually anti hla antibodies, which is what you care about. So for IgG versus IgM, uh, you can DTT treat uh, the CDC cross match uh, and then uh, if it turns negative, then uh, it's likely due to an IgM antibody, which you can ignore. So how do you interpret the CDC cross match? So if the T cell cross match is negative and the B cell cross match is negative, so then you can say that one, either there is no donor specific antibody or that there are uh, donor specific antibodies, but they are non complement binding. And uh, because of which the cross match is not turning positive or that the antibody titer is too low. So if you have a single antigen bead and that shows donor specific antibodies, uh, but the CDC cross match is negative, then what it means is that either they are non complement binding or the titer is too low to turn the CDC cell cross match positive. If both the T cell cross match and B cell cross match are positive, then it is due to a donor specific antibody, either due to class one, because class one antigens are present on both B cells and T cells, or it is a combination of a class one and class two antibody, which is turning both the T cell and B cell positive. If the T cell cross match is negative, but the B cell cross match is positive, so either it could be a donor specific antibody in the class two or a low level class one, and the reason a low level class one can turn the B cell positive and yet the T cell may be negative is that the B cell has a lot more class one antigens than a T cell does. So it may be more sensitive to picking up these low level class one antibodies. Uh, another thing to keep in mind if the B cell is the only thing positive is that there are occasionally false positive sticky B cells. Um, which can uh, be there and there may not be any anti HLA antibodies in the sera, and it's just uh, a sticky B cell which is turning the B cell positive. And the last possibility is that the T cell cross match is positive, but the B cell is negative. And there is usually um, no uh, medical reason for it. Um, the B cell, if the T cell cross match is positive, the B cell should be positive as well. And usually this is a technical error and mostly due to B cell viability. So the B cells weren't viable, which is why the cross match has not, has not picked up. And these interpretations are valid, not just for the CDC cross match, but also for the flow cross match that we're going to talk about next. So the CDC cross match uh, is done to detect the anti HLA antibodies in the recipient directed against the donor cells. And the main goal is to prevent hyperacute rejection of the kidney. It can also be used for other organ transplants for pancreas and heart. Usually they don't use it for liver because the liver is a very tolerogenic uh, organ. In the disease donor transplant setting, we use the cross match to choose the appropriate recipient for this kidney. In the living donor transplant, we use the cross match to choose the appropriate donor for the recipient. So, so there's a, a difference in how we use the cross match uh, in those two settings. So now let's talk a little bit about the flow cross match. So again, you have the donor cells and the recipient sera which incubate together. And if there are no antibodies, we're on the left side. 
uh, the nothing sticks to the cell and the cell goes through the flow cytometer and it gives you like this white curve where the uh, there is almost no fluorescence and that becomes a negative uh, if there are antibodies in this in the sera against the donor the antibodies will stick to the donor cells and not wash off and then you go in with an anti igg fluorescent tagged uh, antibody and so that fluorescent antibody will stick to these igg antibodies sticking to the donor cells and that will fluoresce when they go through the flow cytometer and give you a fluorescence and that curve uh, is what will be picked up by the flow cytometer and this is captured by a mean channel shift which will tell you the degree of uh, positivity uh, for this uh, flow cross match and what uh, the flow cross match tells you is that there is an igg donor specific antibody what it doesn't tell you is that it is uh, whether it is an anti hla antibody so um, it could be a non hla antibody which could be uh, auto antibodies like an nhiv or a lupus patient as well um, compared to the cdc cross match what uh, the flow cross match doesn't tell you is whether these antibodies bind complement or not so you lose out on that information uh, in the flow cross match uh, the flow pra uh, which is the panel reactive antibodies so these are um, beads that have multiple antigens so if you look at this bead there's the green yellow blue so these are multiple different antigens that are coated on the same bead these are made by the companies and uh, you again uh, expose it to the recipient sera if there are no antibodies uh, you get a negative fluorescence um, and if uh, there are antibodies against the uh, these specific hla antigens that are coated on the beads uh, then uh, you go in again with the igg um, anti igg uh, which is labeled with fluorescence or fitsi and uh, you get a fluorescent tag so with this flow pra these are multi multi antigen beads um, looking and you're looking for igg binding to them so and then you will get a percentage of beads which are positive and these are separate class one and class two beads or you can have a combination class one class two which will give you a percentage of how many uh, beads are positive um, to know which hla antigens they are specifically against you will need single antigen bead testing so uh, the pra will tell you or give you a general sense of how uh, positive or how many different uh, exposure this patient may have had in terms of uh, hla antigens this person can make antibodies against but it will not tell you which specific antigens they are against so for that you will need a single antigen bead uh, in the classic uh, panel reactive antibodies the way it was done was you had a panel of cells from 100 people in the community and you would do a cdc cross match against all of them and see how many uh, cdc cross match turned positive and then you would say that this person has a cdc cross match positive against 100 uh, 50 people out of the panel of 100 the main problem is how do you get the panel uh, you need a lot of donor cells and different panels may give you different results so you may not so if you collect a panel of 100 people from delhi it might be very different uh, from a 100 panel from tamil nadu for example because the hla alleles that are in that panel will be very different and so that has now given way to these beads uh, which are available from the lab so it is the test is reliable from one time to another time and from one place to another place the calculated PRA or CPRA. So in the US, uh, this is based on the single antigen bead reports that you get. Um, and then they use the donor HLA typing that has been available for the whole of US for the last one to two years. And then they predict how many people your cross match is going to be positive against. Uh, in India, this is based on the flow PRA and not the single antigen bead reports. And this is based on the number of beads that you have, which are positive. So again, it gives you a sense of the breadth of anti-HLA antibodies, and you can use that to give, get a sense of that. So now we'll talk about the single antigen bead, uh, which is um, one of the main tests uh, in assessing HLA antibodies or rejections uh, and evaluating your cross matches if they're positive as well. Um, so again, you have the recipient sera, um, which may have the antibodies. Each bead here, 
is going to be a different bead which has a different color and is coated with a specific antigen so the uh, each time uh, you're going to get about a hundred a collection of beads that you're going to put uh, and expose them to the recipient sera and each bead has a separate color signature so that uh, when you go through the fluorophore you get uh, you uh, the um, you know which uh, antigen is flowing through the flow cytometer at that time so now you expose them to the sera if there are antibodies they will stick to a particular uh, bead and not stick to the other beads then you go in with the anti igg which is labeled with the fluorescence and then when this bead goes through there are one uh, light which is going to capture what kind of bead it is so let's say this is an a201 bead so this light will tell you that this is the a201 bead and this will tell you what's the fluorescence or the intensity of the fluorescence for each particular bead so let's say an a0201 there's a hundred beads that are going to be captured uh, and that average of the hundred is what is going to be read out at the end so what the single antigen bead tells you is there is an igg anti hla antibody so this is the only one which will tell you that one this is anti hla and that which specific hla it is uh, the pra will tell you that these are there are anti hla antibodies but they will not tell you which specific uh, hla they are against unfortunately what they don't tell you is whether these antibodies are complement binding and what mfi cutoff or mean fluorescence intensity cutoff is really significant and that's something which is a judgment call and each hla lab and each hospital and transplant program has to have their own assessment of this so the mfi or the titers uh, people use can be less than a thousand thousand to four thousand more than four thousand or more than five thousand so each lab will have to have lab and transplant program will have to have their own assessment of it one of the key things which i would want people to take home from this is if a single antigen b test is positive for some hla antibodies please do not refer to them as donor specific antibodies these are anti hla antibodies whether they are donor specific or not will depend on what is the donor typing whether you have it and whether these are donor specific or not many times we um, use this term freely and interchangeably which we should not because then it causes confusions in when we communicate with each other so how do you assess if an anti hla antibody is donor specific or not so and why is it important so this is a study again there's lots of studies like this so if you don't have a donor uh, if you have no hla antibodies your outcome is very good if you have hla antibodies but they are not donor specific antibodies your outcome is very good if you have hla antibodies which are donor specific and they have been there before the transplant the outcome is bad so again there are lots of other studies which have similar results and that is why it's important to identify whether you have just hla antibodies or whether these are donor specific antibodies and so this is an hla report of a person and there are lots of antibodies here the antigens are on the left side the mfi is on the right and the serological typing is on the rightmost column and the donor typing is listed here so the donor is a010168 b1801 and 58 c0302 and 12 and drb11 uh zero uh, one slash four and thirteen zero one slash two so now when we go through this we see that the maximum antibodies and the highest titer antibodies are against a29 a23 and a24 but the actual donor specific antibody which is the a6801 is a 1700 antibody so it is a donor specific antibody and this is the only donor specific antibody on this sheet and then when you go to the b antigens you have a 2440 which is for b18 or 1801 and that is donor specific as well so it is important to identify that it is not these 15000 10000 antibody titers that this patient has which are the donor specific antibodies the antibodies that are donor specific are 1700 and 2400 and so then you can make your own judgment of whether this is someone who you want to proceed as a donor and recipient pair you want to desensitize or what kind of transplant do you want to consider and then you can have a specific discussion based on the risk profile with the donor recipient pair to kind of move forward 
So the same uh, uh, donor recipient pair also had DR antibodies, but if you see, these are DRB5 and DRB4, and we actually don't have DRB3, 4, 5 typing routinely done. So one of the important things is if you have someone who is a recipient who has DRB3, 4, or 5 antibodies, to make sure that you get donor DRB3, 4, and 5 typing to ensure that you are not surprised by the outcome and you go in with full knowledge of what the risk profile is for this donor recipient pair. So if antigens are unknown um, and they have antibodies present in the recipient, then you should get additional typing. So it could also be, as I'm showing, DRB345, but it could be against HLAC, DQ, and DP because the single antigen bead report will give you those um, antibodies as well. So just a couple of cases to kind of highlight a few issues. Uh, so there is a 55-year-old male who's been on dialysis, has had no antibodies previously, and lost his first transplant. And now you check his antibodies uh, with a PRA, and there are 90% antibodies. Though the antigens that this patient has seen from an HLA-A standpoint would be only two from their donor, B would be two, DRB would be two. So how does this person now have antibodies against 90% of the community when he's only been exposed to one person? So that is one of the questions. And on the flip side, there could be someone else who has multiple anti-HLA antibodies, but his CPRA is 0%. So how is that possible? So this gets to kind of the anatomy of the HLA antibodies and the HLA antigens as well. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, these antigens and antibodies. So this is the HLA class one. So there are uh, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three chains on this with a beta two microglobulin uh, while the HLA class 2 has two separate, uh, like DQ alpha, uh, has an alpha 1, alpha 2 chain, and then a beta 1, beta 2. So the difference between do these two is also important to recognize, and we'll talk a little bit about these antibodies next. So these antibodies, so if we were to say HLA A antibodies, so the antibody could be against an alpha 1 component, it could be between alpha 1, alpha 2 component, alpha 2 component or alpha 3 component. So the antibody could be against any of them. And many of these uh, components may be similar across multiple HLA uh, alleles because when we label an HLA allele as different than a previous allele that has been identified, it may be a small component only in the peptide binding region, uh, which is very polymorphic. And that might be enough for us to label it as a different allele. For example, A0203 versus A0202. Uh, but the antibody may be binding to this region, which is common between all of them. And then these antibodies would be against all the HLA A2s and may even be against A3, A4, which may have a same component uh, in all of those HLA antigens. So these epitopes uh, may be common in many HLA molecules or may be limited to a few, and that will dictate uh, whether the HLA antibody causes a whole host or a very high PRA or very low PRA, depending on how many, uh, one, whether that epitope is common to a lot of different HLA alleles. So this is, class one antibodies. So now let's talk a little bit about class two, uh, which uh, can get a little trickier than class one. The reason it can get trickier is because you have possibility of antibodies that only recognize, for example, DQ alpha one chain, DQ alpha two chain, DQ alpha and beta combination, DQ beta chain. And so, so this combination uh, can be very different and each person may be different in that regard. So let's look at a, um, a little example of those. Uh, so the class two antibodies may be DQ A1 or alpha one, DQ beta one or a combination and DP would be the same as well. So when we look at a DQ alpha uh, or DQ report, what you'll find is that the DQ alpha 
and the DQ beta are given together. So like in this, the top one is a DQ A10501 and DQ B10201. So this is the combination that is there and that is what the antibody is against. So you have to actually screen through to see whether the antibody is against DQ beta, DQ alpha or a combination. So in this case, when you screen through, all the 0201 DQ betas are here and are pretty close together. So what this tells you is that this antibody is, is definitely against the DQ beta. And if you scroll through the rest of the report and there is no other DQ beta 0201, then you know that this is a definitely DQ beta antibody. If on the other hand, you had only one DQ beta 0201 and all these other ones below were negative, then you, have, you would have to say that it could be a DQ alpha antibody or it could be a combo antibody and you would have to then look at the DQ alpha 0501 across all the beads that are available to see whether that is a DQ alpha antibody or a combo antibody. And it's important because then if it's a combo antibody, there may be people who are DQ B beta 0201 who could be acceptable donors for your recipient. And uh, you don't want to exclude people just based on uh, this one uh, test. Uh, if uh, that is an acceptable antibody for them. So similarly, uh, if you go down, uh, you have the, the same patient had a DQ beta 1, 0, 3, 0, 2, which is negative, and there are multiple 0, 3, 0, 3, which is negative as well. So uh, even though the DQ B 0, 3, 0, 1 is positive over here, uh, the 0302 and 0303 are negative, which is why resolution typing may be important in these kind of patients for the donor because you can then accept the 0302 and 0303 donors uh, while excluding the 0301 for this recipient. Another uh, component uh, to kind of know about single antigen beads is that there are. Um, with the supreme polymorphism, there are HLA alleles that the single antigen beads will not have. And so if you have a positive cross match and you have HLA antibodies, but you don't find the donor HLA allele in it, it may be that there is an HLA antibody against the donor, but the allele is not in the beads that are available. And so you have to look to ensure uh, that that HLA allele is in the panel. And if it is not, then you may need to impute uh, through softwares that are available, uh, whether the HLA uh, antigen that is there uh, in the donor is going to be something that the uh, recipient will have an antibody against. So we'll show you a couple of examples uh, in the next few slides. Um, this is some of the Indian data that I've uh, presented in um, ISN uh, before. And what it shows is the frequency of missing alleles uh, from the uh, immucor or one lambda. Uh, and if you have HLA-A, you're missing about 19 to 23% of HLA-A uh, from both of, uh, from the Indian uh, SA single antigen bead panels. So that's the ratio of missing alleles. For B, it's about 37 to 54%. Um, and for DRB, it's 26 to 30% as well. So, so there is a significant proportion of HLA alleles which will be missing, uh, but you can use the single antigen bead and uh, the software to kind of impute uh, whether uh, there is antibodies or not. So this is uh, one screenshot from the HLA matchmaker. And what it will tell you is what are the different epitopes that are common between different antigens. So on the left is the HLA antigens. And then on the right are the different epitopes that are you have been recognized as uh, uh, against which antibodies are made routinely. And uh, based on this, you can then say, okay, if there is an antibody against A0208 and against A220, that it's going to be this antibody, this epitope that is being recognized, especially if all the others are negative. If the A0201 and all of these are positive, then it's possibly this epitope which is being recognized. The importance of recognizing these epitopes is that you can even predict which 
antibodies are there and then uh, impute the antigens which are missing whether they would be an antibody against that or not so we'll take a few cases uh, that uh, these are cases that we've had before um, so the sensitization history of this person was that there is no sensitization history uh, cdc cross match was negative but the flow cross match was positive when we did the single antigen bead the there were absolutely no anti-hla antibodies at all which went along with the fact that he had no sensitization history and so uh, the b cell flow was a sticky b cell flow and we went ahead and did the single antigen bead which is a completely negative single antigen bead as shown here um, for both class one and class two we went ahead and did the transplant as a regular transplant with no desensitization no extra uh, immunization uh, immunosuppression and um, the transplant went well and there were no post transplant complications so we look at another transplant so this patient had multiple blood transfusions before he had a b cell weak positive and a t uh, cdc b cell weak positive and a flow b cell weak positive and uh, when we did the donor and recipient typing they were a complete mismatch uh, six by six because this was a uh, 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 a wife donating to a husband uh, and uh, there were multiple anti-HLA antibodies with the highest uh, being 11,000 for class 1 and 3,000 for class 2. So then we went through, so this is the donor typing which is 1101 and 2601. So for the A, the 2601 is negative over here on the top and uh, the 1101 is negative here at the bottom. The B0801 is negative here and 2705 is negative as well. And the DRB 0301 and 0408. Uh, the 0408 is not here, but the 0401, 0405, and 0403, all of these are negative 04202, 0404. All the DR4, DRB 04s are negative. So with that, we could impute that the 04 is negative as well. And so um, we repeated the flow and CDC cross match a week later. The flow and CDC turned negative. So, this was some B cell stickiness which was causing the cross match to be positive. Uh, the donor specific antibodies were not there. So, we did the transplant, but we gave an extra ATG because of his high sensitization and uh, kept his overall immunosuppression a little higher. And uh, now, one and a half years out, he's still doing well with no rejections. So the single antigen bead uh, not only helped us uh, assess the uh, risk profile, uh, but also allowed us to do a transplant where the original CDC and flow cross match were positive, and it helped us identify that these were false positives. We repeated it, and we were able to move forward with the transplant. So now this is another case. Uh, she's had multiple pregnancies. The CDC and the flow cross match were negative. We did the donor and recipient typing, but at that time we were not routinely doing single antigen beads. And uh, lo and behold, what happens is that this is the donor, uh, his husband's brother uh, was the donor. So, and the husband and the brother were actually two haplo matched. So, one week post transplant, we have an antibody rejection. So, uh, luckily, we had the donors, the recipients. Sera stored from the original cross match that we had done. So we ran a single antigen bead on both the pre sample and the time of the rejection. And there were strong donor specific antibodies uh, that were there pre transplant as well as post transplant. And unfortunately, the CDC and the flow cross match did not pick it. So our learning from this is that if you have a high risk transplant, because this was a high risk by history, so a husband or anyone related to the husband or a son or a child donating to a mother, these are antigens that the recipient ha has already seen. So in these kind of situations, our take home now has been that we should do a single antigen bead in these kind of patients, even if the CDC and the flow is negative. So now I'll talk three slides about DSA lysate, which is also called the Luminex DSA or the Luminex cross match. Um, so in theory, it is the perfect test, but in practice, it is not. So let me first talk about how it works. So what the well does is the well has anti-HLA antibodies that are sticking to the well. So these are anti-HLA antibodies. They are sticking to the well. 
then you make a lysate out of the donor cells so you take donor cells you lyse them up and then you put it into the well if uh, the class 1 antigens uh, um, will stick to the class 1 antigen antibody wells and class 2 will stick to the class 2 wells so now these antibodies have stuck you will wash it off the antibodies um, the other extra um, and non hla antigens will wash off and only the hla antigens will be here uh, class 1 hla antigens will be here then you go in with the recipient sera and if the recipient sera has anti anti donor specific hla antibodies they should stick to this and then you go in with the anti igg with the fluorescent tag and you get fluorescence that tells you that yes there are anti hla antibodies that are specifically against the donor so in theory this is a perfect test you don't have to worry about missing alleles and all of that stuff that we talked about uh, just before unfortunately in reality and this is a paper from 2008 which looked at uh, 88 samples from 18 recipients um, and what they found uh, and they compared it to flow cross match and single antigen bead compared to flow cross matches the sensitivity for class 1 was 89% and specificity 98% for class 2 was much lower the sensitivity was only 68% but the specificity was okay uh, and there were 13 uh, discrepant results uh, in nine patients so about 15% uh, discrepancy when you look at it and compare it with the single antigen bead they the dsa lysate gave multiple false positive and false negative especially for class 2 antibodies and what they found was the dq antibodies and dp antibodies were almost completely not picked up at all so this is one of the big downsides to the dsa lysate that dq and dp antibodies are not being picked up another paper uh, published in 2013 uh, now 108 sera are uh, tested with 84 positive and 24 negative for both luminex cross match and single antigen bead and again the class one had a gray zone tail and single antigen bead mfi of 4000 and uh, the sensitivity of only 54 percent and specificity of 100 percent but again c and dp in 10 cases were not detected at all so the third part of this uh, luminex is been published by dr chaco uh, in the indian journal of nephrology where he reported two cases of false positive for class two uh, and these were patients who had no sensitization history but was strongly positive DSA lysate. He rechecked these without adding the donor lysate at all. So now the HLA antibody did not have any HLA antigens on top because there was no donor lysate, but still these anti, the recipient sera was sticking and the cross match was, uh, the DSA lysate was turning positive. And this was due to some non-specific binding that was happening uh, due to uh, some non-anti HLA antibodies. So you have false negative reports because C, DQ, and DP are not being recognized. You have false positive because of non-specific binding. And what you end up with is a test that gives you results which you can't rely on. And so in my mind at present, DSA lysate uh, is something that I would not recommend and uh, would focus on using single antigen bead, CDC, and flow uh, in some combination. So in terms of the hierarchy of the risk of rejection, a positive CDC cross match as shown by Terasaki in 1960s is the highest risk and carries a risk of 80% of immediate or hyperacute rejection. A positive flow cross match and a positive single antigen bead with a donor specific antibody would be the next range. A high PRA, which means that just generalized high uh, HLA antibodies a high HLA mismatch would be next, previous transplants, and then African-Americans based on the data that is out there. So now we look at a couple of cases. Uh, these are open cases to kind of cause more discussion and debate. Um, so this is a 48-year-old male, has end-stage skin disease from Alports, has two donors. Uh, one, he has a known low-level donor-specific antibody, but the CDC and flow cross match is negative another the b flow cross matches positive which is at a low level 
but there are no donor specific antibodies against this donor by the single antigen B. So which donor would you choose? Um, so from my standpoint, I would choose the second donor where there is no donor specific antibody, but the B flow cross matches positive because I know that this is a sticky B flow and there isn't any anti HLA antibody. Whereas the low level donor specific antibody is going to be a preformed donor specific antibody and would increase the risk of rejection for this donor recipient pair for the rest and the duration of the transplant and would shorten the graft survival of this donor recipient pair. So another uh, case is a 48 year old male with uh, end stage kidney disease and gets an offer for a cadaver transplant. The CDC and the flow are negative, but there is a known low level donor specific antibody, which you know from the virtual cross match that you may have from before. So would you accept it um, and do the transplant? So again, this is going to be based on a discussion with the uh, recipient and will also depend on the degree of HLA antibodies does this patient have. So if you have a PRA of let's say 80% and he has only low level DSAs, this may be the best option this person will ever have. And so you would go ahead with the transplant in that situation. But if this person has only like three antibodies, three anti HLA antibodies and this offer that is coming, there is one uh, antibody against them and you think that in a month they'll get another offer then you might want to wait for it. So it also depends on the relative frequency of cadaver offers uh, as well as the degree of HLA antibodies that this person has. And then you can talk about it with the recipient of whether they would like to take and accept the risk uh, that uh, is currently uh, based on this transplant. So summarizing, so the Luminex single antigen bead has the highest sensitivity and can detect even low levels of antibodies. Uh, the problem with this is its specificity can be low. So predicting hyperacute rejections with this, you may have many single antigen beads which are positive, which are donor specific. You do the transplant, but there isn't going to be acute rejections with that. Uh, in on the flip side is the CDC cross match. So if your CDC cross match is positive and it is due to an anti HLA antibody, your likelihood of having a hyperacute rejection is very, very high. But uh, the sensitivity of this test is low, and you may miss many people who have anti donor specific antibodies, and the CDC might be negative. So, and the flow cross matches in the middle in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So, in terms of outcomes, uh, if you look at desensitization protocols, uh, the this is graft loss over five years across from 22 programs that did desensitization. The top line is those who had CDC cross match, which were positive and then were desensitized. And they had 40% graft loss at five years. Um, and majority of these were due to HLA uh, antibodies and rejections. Uh, if you look at positive flow cross match with negative CDC, that's about 30%. And then if you have no antibodies at all, uh, you are much better uh, uh, with that. Uh, sorry, I think I clicked uh, the wrong slide. Um, so, so this is the importance of knowing the CDC cross match, the flow cross match, and uh, whether you have no antibodies, and um, the risk is graded uh, in terms of uh, the cross matches. Uh, the strength of the antibody does predict the cross match. So, um, but it is not a hundred percent. As you can see, the CDC cross match is positive in this study, somewhere around 20 to 20, around 25,000. But there's a whole host of antibody levels at which the CDC cross match is positive. Uh, similarly, a strong flow cross match with a mean channel shift of about 300 is somewhere around 15,000. A flow cross match which is positive but at a lower intensity is around 5,000 and a cross match which is negative is at a lower level. Um, so there is a gradedness to it but again there is a lot of overlap as well uh, in this. So the strength of the cross match predicts antibody rejection as well as uh, we looked at the outcomes in terms of graft loss. So if you have a CDC cross match which is positive 
you will have somewhere around 50 percent risk of rejection within the first month um, as well if you have a cross match which is negative you have almost no antibody rejections at all and if you have a flow cross match positive depending on the strength of the flow cross match you have antibody rejection risk again predominantly in the first 60 days of somewhere between 20 to 30 percent the strength of the donor specific antibodies so the titer also can predict in this study if the titer is more than 10,000 you're running about 50 percent uh, if it is negative uh, then you have almost no risk of uh, antibody rejection and then in the middle uh, around 20 percent uh, if your donor specific antibody is at a lower titer so my take homes from this data is if the cdc is positive you're going to have very high rates of antibody rejection and in india uh, that rejection treatment of rejection the cost of rejection the risk of uh, infections the amount of immunosuppression that is required uh, seems prohibitive and in my mind uh, if you have a cdc positive cross match you should probably avoid the transplant if you have flow positive as well as the mean channel shift which is very strong uh, then also you're probably better off avoiding it a single donor specific antibody more than 10,000 or multiple donor specific antibodies which are more than 5,000 you're probably better off avoiding them for the same long-term risk profile that we talked about so um, what are the roles of the uh, single antigen bead uh, in the living transplant it is to assess if the positive cross match that you have flow or CDC is due to anti HLA antibodies and you may need additional HLA typing for CDQ or DP. Um, after the transplant, you can assess the rejection as well and uh, guide therapy uh, after rejection. And before, uh, you can get a sense of the risk of rejection, uh, even if there are no donor specific antibodies by the uh, breadth of anti HLA antibodies. In the disease donor transplants, you can, if you have the single antigen bead before, you can also. Label unacceptable antigens uh, like it's done in the US. You may want to do additional typing for CDP and DQ, uh, and then you can also calculate the calculated PRA based on that. So, coming to the last uh, slides, so what's my current workup uh, protocol or paradigm? Um, if cost is not an issue from a patient standpoint or from a program standpoint, I decide that the full assessment is the best way of moving forward. Then I would say a CDC cross match, a flow cross match, and a single bead antigen bead testing, and a donor HLA typing, which is a full A, B, C, D, Q, D, R, D, P, would give me the absolute comprehensive evaluation of uh, the donor and recipient pair. And uh, that would be, uh, in my mind, the best way of assessing a, uh, a donor recipient pair at the present time. However, there are costs uh, as an issue in India many times. So if you have a cost sensitive patient or your program needs to be cost sensitive, then in that case, what I would do is I would keep sensitization history as the fulcrum because this is no cost required and gives you a good discrimination in terms of the risk profile. So there's absolutely no sensitization then a CDC and a flow cross match is probably good enough. And if they're both negative, you can move forward with the transplant. If either of them are positive, then you should move forward with a single antigen bead. And then based on that, uh, you can determine whether the CDC and flow are false positives and you can go forward with the transplant or if they're really positive, and then you need to decide whether you want to go for desensitization or something else. If the sensitization history is positive, then in my mind, uh, you're best served by a CDC cross match, flow cross match and single antigen bead. Some could even argue that a CDC flow and a PRA might be enough, uh, but in my mind, um, the history, sensitization history is a good marker. And with that, a single antigen bead is probably uh, a good um, way of uh, evaluating this. Uh, if it is negative, you can go forward with the transplant. If they are positive, then you can assess based on the severity, degree, and what tests of these are positive whether you want to do a swap, you want to do an alternative donor, or whether you want to desensitize. So take home messages are HLA typing is the cornerstone of current assessment. And in my mind, we should start considering moving to NGS as well as full HLA typing for ABC, DQ, DR, and DP. 
a combination of cdc flow cross match and single antigen bead is the current best and most comprehensive evaluation for the donor recipient pair assessing class 2 donor specificity can be tricky there are missing alleles um, which are present in about 20 to 30 percent of our uh, indian our donors who are going to have these alleles and the single antigen bead won't capture them so you may need to use the hla matchmaker uh, or other softwares like that to assess that and uh, in my mind we should not be doing any dsa lysate or lumnex cross match so that's uh, uh, the talk and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you Ajay for an excellent and a very crisp clear talk that you gave. You almost made it like a workshop specifically looking at your worksheets and going running down through the alleles as well as their antibody titers was uh, very nice and I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I just have a question. Do you think that these tests require aggressive quality controls or and such tests should be performed with laboratories which have high volumes or Absolutely. are there risks or are there risks when centers with low transparent volumes would install such techniques and they may run a risk of uh, creating problems for themselves i completely agree um cdc cross match flow cross match are tests that are routinely done by many uh, centers as well as many labs uh, but uh, unless there are good quality controls, you may get uh, poor results and you may get false positives as well as false negatives. And I'm sure anyone who's done and dealt with these tests repeatedly over uh, the last few years and has had multiple either people or labs that they've interacted with and they would have had issues with either the flow cross match or the CDC and had when you cross check it with the single antigen bead or with another lab uh, you get discrepant results and then you have to question uh, the lab uh, and go back to them so i think a good quality lab which has good controls uh, and a hla person that you can communicate with to assess where is the issue and how strong is it is it a real positive so many times talking about the mean channel shift um and why is the test the way it is whether it's the b cell flow or the t cell flow especially putting all of these things together the single antigen bead the flow and the cdc together is critical and i think being able to communicate with whichever lab you're losing uh, using uh is i think critical so you need to have an hla lab person that you can communicate with freely to discuss especially some of the complicated ones or the complex ones or where it doesn't make sense uh, and so that I think is critical. And uh, to add to it, there is, is there any, any way a nephrologist can judge the QC and the goodness of a lab short of a peer review or his own experience? Uh, so that I'm not so sure. So I'm guessing um, just by, there are some internal, so if you look at a single antigen bead test report, there is internal QC in it. And my right. internal QC is, whether the recipient's own HLA alleles are negative. So okay. the recipient should not be making auto anti-HLA antibodies. That is brilliant. That is not to be that is not to happen. So if an a, a single antigen bead report has HLA antibodies which are positive or strong against the recipient's own HLA, then I say that that test has some flaw or the whole background is high. So that usually happens for HLA-C. So if you look at multiple reports over time, HLA-C has antibodies which are 1,000 to 2,000 range in many people, and that background is high. And the donor, the recipient itself, will be in that same range. So then I ignore that, because I know that the background itself for HLA-C is high in that report. If for A, B, or DR, something like this happens, then I'm not so sure what actually happened in the lab. And then I will question the lab and ask them what happened in this, because the, you should not be making auto anti HLA antibodies. So I, use the, nice. so I use the donor, the recipient's own HLA as a QC for single antigen beads. I think that's smart and that's quite educative. I have a question from Dr. Samir Bhuvania, who says, how do we test for non HLA antibodies? so that is a whole different ball game and uh, so there are mic a antibodies endothelial antibodies 
AT receptor antibodies and um, what test is available and how do you want to use it, which patients to use it. That in itself is one a very complicated issue and I'm not sure at present with the tests that we have available how relevant it is. So I would say at present I would do it only if you have a rejection with C4D positivity and PTC capillaritis and you do a single antigen bead and it is negative or it has showing you that there are no donor specific antibodies. In that kind of a setup I would go to a lab that does these non HLA antibodies routinely does them well and ask them to run them for a non HLA antibodies. So that would be the only subgroup in which I would kind of look for or try and go after non HLA antibodies. I would not do them routinely or for pre transplant workup. Um, I would do it only if someone has a rejection or has had a transplant that has failed from antibody rejection but there are no donor no HLA antibodies or no donor specific antibodies in that kind of subgroup I would go after these uh, great I have another question from Dr. Mohit uh, sir some labs report anti HLA antibodies as anti HLA class 1 or class 2 antibodies with respective MFI how do they do it so so that is either a DSA lysate test uh, in which they will say a lysate class one with an MFI or a class two with an MFI. So that is the test that I was talking about that I would not want to order. Um, the other way that they can sometimes do is that they have a flow PRA uh, test which they uh, then calculate a mean MFI from multiple beads. But usually uh, they will give you a percentage for that and not an MFI. The MFI ones usually are DSA lysates. So that's the test that I don't want anyone doing. And that's where they give you a class one MFI of 3000 or an MFI class two of 4000. And I don't know what to do with that. So I don't recommend anyone ordering it. Uh, Dr. Shailendra Shresht asks once a cross match test come positive by any method, I have seen some nephrologists saying that let's repeat it after a few months and it might come negative or MFI or tighter may fall. Does this yeah. happen and if yes, how? So so again, um, I would say that if it is an anti HLA antibody that caused the cross match to be positive, that cross match is never going to change. You make anti HLA antibodies, those anti HLA bodies are going to be for life. Uh, there are only very rare transitory HLA antibodies that can happen from um, crossover, uh, which is from vaccinations and viral infections but they will very very rarely turn a cross match positive so so a cross match turning negative is probably because the technique of the lab is faulty or the cells and their viability and how they were done is faulty otherwise there is absolutely no reason why an anti hla antibody that caused a cdc cross match to be positive or a flow cross match to be positive to turn negative and even if it turned negative Maybe the tighter went from 10,000 to 4,000 and the cross match turned negative. That still is a donor recipient pair that is a very high risk of antibody rejection down the road if it was a real anti HLA antibody. So I would rather than doing wait two weeks or wait four weeks, I would do the full assessment and do the single antigen bead. As I showed in my cases, there are flow B cross matches across the world, even in the US, there are sticky B cell flows in labs that are world class and top of the line. Um, that happen and that's not because that the lab is at fault It's the B cell which is sticky. Um, so in those situations if you have a single antigen bead which is completely clean with no donor specific antibody or sometimes even no anti HLA antibody you can rest assured that you can go forward with the transplant and you don't need to wait the two weeks or four weeks to turn the flow negative. You can go ahead even if the flow is positive as we've done before. Um, and uh, we have not even repeated the flow cross match because we've been confident that this is a sticky B cell flow and we've gone forward and done the transplant with no issues and we've not given any extra immunosuppression compared to what we usually do for those transplants. Brilliant. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Venkatesh asks the HLA alleles represented in DSA by single bead testing. Are they the mm -hmm. same across different labs or are they different? So there are two bead panels that are available. One is Immucor, which provides one set of bead panels and the other one is one lambda which provides a separate set of bead panels. 
there is a lot of similarity between the two, but there are some differences between the two. So the study that I showed, which was mine, I looked at both the bead panels and there's a lot of overlap, but there are some differences in there. Uh, but usually those are the two companies that provide the bead panels and they give you kind of about the similar uh, results. Uh, I have a question from Dr. Pradeep. In case of sensitization history and resource poor setting, is that flow cross match also needed or can we go ahead with only CDC and single antigen bead? So, so in my mind, the flow cross match actually adds quite a bit of value um, to um, the overall um, risk profile. If you have an absolutely zero sensitization history, meaning nothing at all, um, and it's a reliable person, then I would say a CDC cross match and you can negative and go forward with the transplant. The problem many times is our history, especially in terms of blood transfusions, can be very sketchy. And many patients will tell you that they have no history. And we've done this because we did a study where we did everyone's sensitization history, CDC cross match, flow cross match, and flow PRAs. And we were surprised by patients who had flow PRAs as well as flow cross matches um, that were positive despite them telling us that there was absolutely no sensitization at all. So, um, so that can happen. And uh, the percentage is somewhere between 10 to 15% uh, of people who have uh, no sensitization history, but will have some PRA or flow cross match, which is positive. Um, and so uh, you might be missing some. So if you're very, very tight, uh, for money, you could kind of consider just a CDC cross match in those patients who have an absolutely stone cold negative sensitization history. But in my mind, you're doing a four and a half to six lakh transplant of six to eight thousand flow cross match is worth the money. So, so I'm going to make the argument that an eight thousand or six thousand rupee test for a flow cross match is worth the money in a five to six lakh transplant because this is something which is going to be a good prognosticator for you. So in my mind, even a 30,000 single antigen bead is worth its money in a six lakh transplant. So, so I would argue that that is where we need to push for um, that you're doing a five lakh, six lakh transplant um, that a single antigen bead is also worth it. Leave alone a flow cross match, which is a much cheaper test. Great. Dr. Pradeep asks, another request is to explain about virtual cross-match procedure. So the virtual cross-match uh, would be, um, and I'll try and go back to a slide where I can kind of do that. So this is like we do uh, this. So uh, this is a negative patient. So let me give you a positive one. So, so like this. So this is someone's single antigen B report. And you go through this bead report and you see what are the donor ant antigens. So in this case, you look at the donor antigen is 0101. So you look for where is 0101 and that's negative. So the this column here, the titer is only 284. So that's negative. So A0101, there is no donor specific antibody. Then you go to A6801 and you look and you see that this is 1776. So this is someone who has a donor specific antibody at about 1700. Then you go to B, you look at B1801, and on this, 1801 is 2440, so that's positive. And then you go to 5801, which is 479, which is negative. So in this case, you have a, a virtual cross match where there are two donor specific antibodies at 1700 and 2400, and two which are negative. You would do the same for the C and DRB, and then you would come up with okay, this person has four specific antibodies which are in the 1000 to 2000 range. And then you take a call of whether you want to accept this donor uh, for this recipient and the virtual cross match and then do the actual CDC and flow, or you think this is unacceptable for you. And you say, we are not going to take this donor at all. And we're going to look for the next donor. So that's how you would do the virtual cross match uh, for a specific donor. You would have to have the single antigen bead report in front of you. You would have to do, have the donor typing. If you're doing it against multiple donors, you're going to need to do this same process multiple times over to figure out which virtual cross match is the best one for you and for this donor recipient for this recipient 
Uh, another question is, suppose CDC and flow both are negative, but virtual cross match is positive, MRI more than 15,000. What would yeah. be your comment? So this is um, um, the flow. So a CDC, which is negative, can be explained by the that, that the antibody is non-complement binding. So it could be an antibody which is there, which is IgG, but doesn't bind complement, and that's possible. The flow cross match usually would be positive, but again, it can happen that it's negative. But what it is telling you is that this is an IgG antibody, it is anti-HLA, and it is donor specific because you have the donor typing as well, uh, which is telling you that it's there. So I would be very careful, and I would say that again, after discussion of risk with the recipient you could consider desensitizing this patient and saying that this is the best transplant you can get because this is the only donor you have and your cdc and flow are negative in this in this comp uh, recipient donor pair and that we will desensitize you and you have to accept some increased risk of rejection based on the studies that are out there that risk of rejection is somewhere between 20 to 40 percent for antibody rejection within the first year and so with that risk discussion, I think it would be fair to say that we can move forward with the transplant in a desensitization protocol with discussion of risk with the recipient and the donor. Uh, so I think that would be a fair uh, point and you can move forward. But again, it has to be a transplant program and the donor recipient that to, to accept the risk and discuss the risk. And Dr. Pankaj asks, uh, how do we go about rituximab causing cross-match positive? Yeah, so that is a troublemaker. So I would say there is no way of solving that trouble. Um, the retux is going to stick to your B cells and then your cross match is going to be positive. So the way to solve it and the way we've solved it for ABO incompatible transplants is to do the cross match before you give the retux. And then you don't repeat the cross match at the time of transplant at all. You trust your HLA lab and your cross match that you've done before and you give the retux and then you don't do it. The problem comes when you have an HLA incompatible transplant, where you have, let's say, a CDC cross match, which is positive. You want to turn it negative and you've given it drugs. That is going to be an impossible uh, thing to solve. So, um, so that, in my mind, is an issue of either you have to make your mind up before. Are you going to give retux as part of your desensitization? If you are, what are you going to do for CDC or flow if they are positive beforehand? Because the flow is going to come back positive after you've given retux as well, in which case you're going to be in a patch 22. What you can do is the single antigen bead. So you can consider doing the single antigen bead before, you give retux, you do desensitization, and at the time of transplant, you do a single antigen bead again. And the single antigen bead should turn negative, or the titer should be much lower, and that could be the green signal to do the transplant. So that might be the way to kind of do it, but your flow and CDC are going to be positive, and there I don't know of a way of kind of turning it to accurately reflect the real situation inside the body rather than the retux situation. Dr. Samir asks, uh, could you comment on DNA transcripts and classifiers? Uh, DNA transcripts? And classifiers. Uh, is this uh, the DNA uh, transcript for rejection evaluation? Is that the question? Dr. Samir, I have unmuted. You can ask your question. Yes, yes. Yes, now the BAM criteria includes transcripts and classifiers to diagnose yeah. ABMR. ABMR, yeah, yeah. So, so this was a predominantly pre-transplant uh, evaluation talk, so which is why I haven't talked anything about uh, how to evaluate rejection and the BAM classification at all. So those things are out there. The problem is the availability in India, the applicability, and what do you do by labeling it DNA and how is it different by the histology and which are the patients that are going to be histology negative DNA positive because that's where it's going to be additive otherwise my histology is good enough I have an AMR or does it matter whether the DNA is positive on top of that so um, it's only going to be for patients whose histology is negative CCOD is negative in which case you do the DNA transcript and the DNA transcript is positive and then you say that this is AMR so at present I don't use it I don't know where and how it's available and which labs are doing it reliably. So at present, I um, wouldn't use it. But once it comes and available, then we'll see how it works. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, Dr. Manisha yeah. asks, what is the relevance of cross-match done and reported at different temperatures? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, so that is probably a question we can ask one of the HLA persons. Um, I'm not sure about the difference with temperature and how that impacts. So, so unfortunately, I can't answer that right now, but we can probably have an HLA person if there's someone around. Uh, Dr. Manisha, you are unmuted. Do you want to elaborate on it? So we have had many reports in which they have given B cell cross match at four degree uh, positive and at room temperature negative. So I'd spoken to the uh, his, uh, HLA uh, person there and the explanation was given that these are IgM antibodies at low temperature. They might disappear over a period of time. They're not anti-HLA antibodies. So we were asked to wait for three to four weeks and after that repeat the cross match. If it was negative, we were supposed to go ahead with the transplant. But I could not find any data as to what is the relevance. So, 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 the, that's it. so the usual way to find out an IgM antibody is to DTT treat it. Mm -hmm. So you treat with DTT and if it is negative with DTT, then you can go forward with the transplant right away rather than having to wait the four week kind of thing. So, so I would say if it is an IgM antibody, just treat with DTT and it will turn negative and then a DTT negative cross match is a negative cross match. So, so that's what we've done and followed in terms of IgM antibodies. Uh, the temperature one um, is something which I haven't um, done much. Dr. Manisha, did okay. you repeat it after four weeks? Yes, we did repeat and it was actually negative. So, yes, we did. Quite, quite nice. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Venkatesh asks, how to assess the HLA matchmaker you were discussing if the DSA doesn't have donor HLA alleles in it? Is it available online? Yes, it is available online. The um, slide that I showed is actually stuff I have. So this is, um, so if you Google HLA matchmaker, you can go to their website. It is freely available, freely downloadable. So this is the HLA matchmaker. So it is a complicated program. It has like six different Excels, but there is a very good explanation on how to use it. Where do you put the data? So each Excel has like eight pages on eight um, worksheets on it, but it will tell you where do you put the data and where do you see the output and how do you evaluate the output? So, so it's so if anyone's interested in having fun with it, uh, it's a fun thing to kind of play around with uh, also even if you don't want to use it and it gives you good insight so so this is one of the sheets from the excel and this goes a long way down because you can imagine this is just a0101 to a0221 and this goes all the way down to a b c d r d q so a b c in one excel and d r d q d p in another excel so so you can and it will give you what are the different epitopes for all of them? It will also, if you put in the antibodies, it will tell you what antibodies or antigens it thinks uh, they can be an issue with. If you just put in, you don't even have the single antigen B report. You have just two um, um, donor and recipient uh, HLA antigens. Uh, you just have the HLA typing. You can put those and it will tell you which epitopes are similar and which epitopes are different to then tell you what's the risk of antibody formation. So there's lots of different versions in terms of this. Um, again, in my mind, the way right now, what it would help is if you have someone who has HLA antibodies, if someone who has absolutely zero HLA antibodies, meaning the single antigen bead is completely negative, meaning not even one HLA antibody, I don't think you need to get into this at all. So even if the single antigen, if the donor bead, a donor HLA is not included in the bead, you can be confident that there is none because there will be some HLA antibody which would show up on the bead panel uh, because the epitopes, they, the bead panels are actually pretty comprehensive in terms of covering different kinds of epitopes and different beads. So, so there would be coverage as long as there is no HLA antibodies at all, you can go forward. But if there are HLA antibodies and your donor bead is missing, that's when I think you should consider using an HLA matchmaker to see if that HLA bead that is missing has an antibody epitope which is already been reflected in your single antigen bead and then you can kind of see uh, if that is the case and this is true um, for uh, kidney transplants 
uh, as well as haplo bone marrow transplants where uh, i have used it uh, for a couple of our bone marrow um, colleagues um, and uh, predicted that this is someone who is going to have a high risk of rejecting the graft and they have avoided the transplant or done desensitization uh, in that kind of a situation so this is uh, something which is useful not just for kidney transplants or heart transplants but also something which might be useful for um, a bone marrow transplants where they are doing a haplo transplant with multiple transfusion histories where this might be an issue dr yogendra asks yes hello any comment no, on yes. c3d any comment on c3d assay on luminex platform yeah so c3d as well as other complement fixing antibodies so uh, there are studies which seem to suggest that they are slightly better at predicting uh, outcomes and antibody rejection than single antigen beads alone but there are some other studies which also seem to suggest that all the complement fixing does is it changes your positive threshold so if you have a single antigen bead positive at 1000 and you instead change your threshold to 4000 everything above 4000 is going to be complement fixing on those tests so so some uh, studies from germany have kind of suggested that the c3d test all it does is it just moves your threshold up and so it is why that is why it is more specific but you're losing out on sensitivity so so again i'm not sure at present it is not as widely available the test is a little more costly and uh, at present i'm not sure how much more it adds on top of a single antigen bead uh, so at present i would like to keep things simple for myself as it is single antigen bead cdc and flow are complicated enough so uh, at present i would try to stick to that and not add the c3d to my mix Uh, Dr. Suhas uh, is asking, Luminex DSA by Lysate, is it obsolete, or still we can use it as a screening test for SAB so, as a cost-cutting in, test? In my mind, I would absolutely not do it. It adds more complications, as Dr. Chako has shown. It has multiple false positives. It has multiple false negatives with CDQ and DP being missed completely. so in my mind it adds no value and it complicates your life even more so i i, I know it is a test that is done routinely and it is a test that is uh, probably uh, more ordered than any of the other tests but in my mind at present this technology is not uh, something um, that i would want to use at all in theory it work it is a great test but in practice and in real life it doesn't work uh thank you ajay that was the last question we had uh, thank you everyone for an excellent participation and thank you ajay once again for a great talk i wish you all a very nice evening and we'll close the webinar now